Brigand Ohaka was created by one person by the power of weed and alcohol. It's set in a post-apocalyptic world. It's a blend of a FPS and an RPG which was inspired both by Deus Ex and Gothic. This game recently passed its 3 year anniversary back on July 11th. And now, let's see how the game turned out. And something to note, the creator is very active in the community, so if you ever find an issue or if you just want to compliment him, feel free to let him know in the Steam discussion boards or even just leaving a review. When you start off, you get a choice of three faces. They don't matter, you don't really uh, see them that often. What's more important are the stats. This game is very stat dependent, just like Morrowind or Gothic. In the beginning, your character is going to feel very weak, but this game has a very good character progression system, so by the end, you'll feel much improvement. You have a choice between a couple of preset classes. I would recommend Gunslinger for beginners. The stats are all self-explanatory and some of them are more useful than others, but the only one I would completely avoid is stealth, since a majority of the enemies have infrared vision. Another one would be strength, because in the late game, if you're up close to an enemy, you're going to be killed instantly, because enemies in this game do a lot of burst damage at one moment, so if you're up close to that, you're done. <laughs> Don't try and be a jack of all trades either. Focus on one playstyle, and for beginners, I recommend focusing on the gun stats and the software stat. Those stats will help make the game a lot more easier because this game is punishing, and for the software ability, a lot of the lore is hidden in computer logs, and you'll miss out on that if you don't have a high enough level in it. Some of the skills complement each other too, like strength and chemistry to make a poison blade, and others contradict each other like charisma and voodoo due to the insanity penalty. I guess that people don't like crazy people who don't wear a mask. And a good tip to know is that the cap for the skills is 50, but there's one trainer that can train vitality to 65, but it's only in the late game. You start off in a prison, like a certain RPG series, but it is far from it, and you'll see why. There's going to be a war between Bob's security force and the Illusia tribe, and already in the start of your cell, you can choose which side you want to kind of favor towards. Don't fret about this, you'll get plenty of chances to change what side you want to be on. But Serps is a good lesson that your actions in this game does have consequences, and what you do will shape how the story plays out. You learn that you've been framed for murder, but you've been given a pardon and forced to work for the people that framed you. Already, they seem like malicious assholes, just like Voodoo Man with his dialogue choices. Starting off, you have to help Ricardo defend this plantation from the Lucia tribe. He gives you some jink, which is the currency in this world, to buy a weapon. I sense a bit of a trust issue with this, since they're giving a gun to a person that they just told that they framed for murder, and blackmailing him to work for them. Already, the Lucia tribe is looking pretty good right now. At the target range, you'll see why I recommend investing into the pistol stat. As it increases, your accuracy will get better, but it is possible to beat the game without any stats and pistols or rifles, but I'd only recommend doing that in, say, like a second playthrough once you know what you're doing. So how does leveling up work in this game? You have to use trainers to use your stat points. Trainers can only teach you what they know, so if they only have, say, 10 in survival, you can only level up 210 with that trainer. And throughout the world you'll find different people that specialize in different skills. Some of the stats you can easily max out early game, while others not until late game. You can get stat points by flushing toilets, doing some target practice, finishing a chapter, and completing quests. The charisma and software stats also give bonus points for doing things that relate to the activity, say like negotiating for a better deal, for completing a quest, or during the hacking minigame. You can also get points for doing these collectathon quests, like one person asks for pearls and he'll give you a point each for them, or there's another guy where you can sell food to. Stat points are also used to unlock abilities. Some of them are useful, others not so much. Continuing with the story, if you go outside the plantation, you meet Zack, and he gives you the option to side with the Lucha tribe. The mission is to steal Ricardo's recipe for the banana beer, 
He doesn't tell you which house is his, so it's a bit vague, but from deduction you can tell that's the only locked house in the entire plantation. Now you can't break in like rents do, or else your respect of the UBNS will decrease and everybody will go hostile to you, and you don't want that at this point. It's too dangerous. Now's a good time to talk about saving. You only get one save per character, and you can only save in beds, so no save scummings allowed in this game. Which for this game, it's kinda needed since you can walk across each map of this game in under a minute. It'll take about 5 to walk from the starting point all the way to the end point in this game. But each area is packed with places to explore and things to do, while the difficulty of this game will keep you back and have you repeat saves over and over. But like this game says, you will die a lot and you will like it. Just like your favorite masochistic neighbor that plays Dark Souls with a rock band controller. However, you can get creative with how you solve this problem. For example, you can use a grenade to open up the door, with the guard right next to it. As long as no one's looking, you can steal whatever you want, without any penalty. However, if you're caught, your respect with the faction will decrease. Before returning to Zack, you can go into the bar and see that there are quests that require a stat check. There's also a guy in here named Gao Zong that you can help out by finding his bionic eye. Returning to Zack, he rewards you with a voodoo tune. To learn a voodoo spell, you have to complete a game of hangman, and the word is related to the type of spell you're trying to learn. There's not really a penalty for failing it except for having to wait a half a day, but you can do that just by resting in a bed. Speaking of resting, it's time to wait for night for the raid to occur. Before that, let's talk about the sound effects and the music. They're both pretty generic, but they get the job done. Especially the music, it's quite enjoyable. It fits the gameplay and setting very well, so I have to give props to the creator for that. And as you can see with the graphics, they're not the greatest, but you can't really blame it since it's only one person making this entire game. And it's the gameplay that matters the most. So let's see how the gameplay works by watching the raid. And since I'm trying to align with the Lucia tribe, I won't be participating in it. So sit back and watch the show. As you can see, the AI has some issues. After killing the soldiers and murdering one of their own in cold blood, they eventually destroy the brewery distilleries. The AI's noodle arm accuracy is justified though, because they are affected by stats and also have limited inventory slots just like the player. Of course, Ricardo is pissed and he orders Voodoo Man to report his failure to Uncle Bob. And if you follow this part of the story, you'll lose out on Laughing Coyote, a possible companion. Before we go, let's take a look at the weather. Whenever it rains, it prevents the use of cooking fires. It often muffles footsteps, which makes it easier to sneak around. The nighttime also helps with sneaking around, but also aids your enemies because certain enemies turn transparent during the night. Another thing to add on is that shops close during this time. You may have noticed that quests do not have markers and you have to follow directions and the only ways of navigation in this game are a compass and a map that takes up precious inventory space. If you healed the barkeep, he'll give you another mission to grab him some contraband from another soldier. In order to even have the option to buy the contraband, you have to use the game's unique type and dialogue mechanic. You can use it with other characters to mention how their relation is with another person or what they think of a certain thing, or even to get more information about a quest. If you return the way you came, you'll notice that there's now a UBNS inspector that popped out of nowhere. You can't smuggle a cocaine past him, 
and there's a couple of ways of doing it, but I'll leave it to you to discover them. When going into Bob's headquarters, I noticed a bit of an inconsistency in the dialogue with how he's mad at me, but they're glad to see me and needs my assistance, so it's a bit weird. We're also introduced to the gambling and hacking mechanics. Gambling's a nice way to earn some extra jink if you know how to play it, and with it you can buy guns, supplies, armor, or even cybernetic modules. Hacking works like Minesweeper, and if you fail it, you'll get system shocked. Going up to Uncle Bob, he's willing to forgive me about the brewery, and he gives me the mission to go kill Zack, who's hiding in the hills. So despite helping him destroy the brewery, I'm now put forth to kill him. And this game does seem to want to put you on the side of playing with the army, instead of being with the Illusia. Especially since siding with the Illusia tribe makes the early game a bit more harder, since you lose Ricardo as a trainer and you get the loss of Elsie as a possible companion. So in order to even the odds, let's get Galzone's eye for him to join us on our journey. A good tip is to use the enemy's AI and terrain against them. Across from that spot is a graveyard, where you can encounter carrion demons. These little gremlins get up in your face and can deliver a punishing poison effect on you. And sometimes it's better just to retreat and get help. Back to the tavern, we can finally recruit Gaio and continue our journey. Oh dear. The AI has some pathing issues in this game. Luckily, you can control your party members, and you don't have to worry about doing this all the time because if they do get lost, then they will automatically teleport to you after a certain amount of distance. Before we go to kill Zack, there's one thing that we forgot at the graveyard. If you have a shovel, you can dig up spots around the world. They usually contain voodoo tombs or sometimes grenades. They also give a skill point each time you do this. There's also an altar at the graveyard, which you can use to reduce your insanity level from using too much voodoo magic. If your insanity level is too high, then you cannot sleep at beds, which means no saving. Also during the night, you'll get a confusion penalty for hearing voices all the time. Voodoo is useful during the late game once you have enough meta and voodoo stats built up, but during the early game you don't do enough damage to even hurt the enemy because your stat is so low. To learn more about how voodoo works in the world and how much the lore is, there's plenty of books to read. Into the hills, we get a glimpse of the AI's hyper-aggressive nature. In one case, while fighting two enemies right next to me, Galzone runs across the map to some other enemies in the distance, leaving me to die. Even after all that I did for him, that ungrateful bastard. Not only that, but in one instance, he ended up shooting me in the back. What the hell did I ever do to him? Fortunately, there's team orders that you can issue. It can help you deal with your team's AI a lot better. And a tip of advice with using them, it's better to set up choke points with the team rather than to attack head on. Along with showing another case of the AI's hyper-aggressiveness, I wanted to point out that sometimes items can overlap each other and it makes it a bit hard to pick them up. Now you might be wondering, what's the point of having team members if you have to keep babying them around? Well, they can soak up damage for you provide extra damage for you, have extra inventory slots that you can use, and depending on the path you take, you may have to level up your party to increase certain stats, since getting some stats to a higher level is a bit exclusive depending on what faction you're trying to favor. And as you visit new areas, they provide additional lore, mainly regarding to them so they have like their own little sub-stories. If you want a party member that's a bit more disposable, you can recruit mercenaries at your local bar, or with a high enough charisma stat, you can hire soldiers on the field by paying them a little bit of jink. Finally, we reach the big bad boss, Zack. And I'll admit, it took me a couple of tries to kill him. And some of the attempts felt a bit silly with shots missing, spells hitting walls, shots going through walls. They weren't the most elegant of fights, but in the end, Sometimes you just gotta cheese it in order to win. On the way back to turn in the quest, we run into Running Man, one of the few options of fast travel in this game. 
The other two methods are a repairable Humvee if your hardware skill is high enough, and canoes that you can find scattered around the map. Once you turn in the quest, there are two possible routes that you can go for. One of them is the Topo Tracks, which favors the UBNS, and the other is the Scumlands, if you want to side with the Lucia tribe. Now you're not stuck with that faction on either route you take, but those paths generally favor that faction over the other. Either path you take will leave you partyless, so you're going to have to be alone on this, so hopefully you built up your character well to be self-sufficient. And either path starts chapter 2, and at the end of every chapter you get 8 skill points to use, and whoever's in your party at that moment levels up as well. This is the only way to level up your party members, because they're too shy to talk to trainers. And there are some additional things I would like to add in before we end this video that I didn't get to talk about. There's a crafting system which uses the chemistry stat which is based off the anarchist cookbook where you can make things like grenades and supplies. There are two other spots within the game where you lose your allies so you have to be self-sufficient or else you're not going to have a fun time during those moments. Enemies stay dead and items don't despawn so during the early game you're going to want to utilize them to scavenge to survive to have an easier time too. During the mid and late game, you don't really have to scavenge as much because you're more built up as a character. If you come across any loose planks, they break at the midpoint so jump over it and this isn't mentioned in the game so I'm kind of helping out with this now. Your choices do matter in how you get to a place and what happens during those points. And the effects of your actions are shown at the end of the game like how Fallout had their picture slideshow or the same thing with Wasteland. And the story is a bit bizarre, so that weed and alcohol influence really does show through. So the game will keep your interest, and if you're interested in more, the creator Brian Lancaster has implemented a Steam Workshop so you can create your own scenarios, and there already is one in the works, so there's going to be additional community-made content. There's also a challenge map DLC called Fortress which takes place after the main game, but it doesn't add anything new to the story, it's just like a wave defense challenge. Finally, there's another DLC called Panama which adds on more to the story and also takes place after this game, which I will be covering in a future video. Overall, Brigand Owaka is a very fun game if you can get past the initial issues. Now I will admit it took me a day to get used to it, but once I did, I was hooked. It's a uniquely styled game, and it doesn't cost much on Steam either, so I'd recommend picking it up, even just to try. This game has a lot of passion behind it, and it shines through.